I wasn't really involved in organizing this, and Sarah especially, who has kept everything running smoothly. And of course, I need to thank uh, Lev and Avi, who hopefully will rejoin us soon, um, for you know making this discovery 30 years ago, which has led to so many interesting consequences that we've been discussing at this conference. Uh, all right, so, oh, okay. Keyboard's not actually working for me to change. Oh, there we go, okay. So this talk doesn't have very many slides with words. I'm gonna explain uh, everything in each slide as we go through. So the exceptions are this slide and the, the last slide. Um, so everyone here knows what the scenario is, so I probably don't really need to go over this in any great detail. Um, the notion that we get an interaction-free measurement typically follows from the assumption that once we know where the particle has ended up, we can retrodict a single classical path that the particle would have followed from the source to the final detector where we found it. Um, and if you don't make that assumption, then we all know that the wave function spreads out throughout you know, the interferometer of these experiments. <laughs> and so there is some part of the quantum state that's going where the bomb is. So the question is, do you really think that uh, it's interaction free if the bomb fully blocks the, uh, the particle from getting you know, past the bomb and getting to the detector? Um, so there's, there's like a weak argument you could make that maybe somehow it tunnels through so it goes to where the bomb is and then still makes it to the detector. There's no good reason to think that it tunnels through, but this seems like another sort of loophole in the argument. <clears throat> okay, so um, this is the Moxon interferometer. I won't even spend a moment on this slide. Everyone knows how this works, but again, uh, we have it tuned so that all of the photons would go out this bright port. By the way, if anyone has any questions at any stage, just interrupt me. Because like I said, there's not a lot of words on these slides. I'm going to try to explain things, but if anything's not clear, just let me know. Okay, so here's the core scenario. Uh, we have added something to uh, one of the arms. It's going to block the photon path. It's a bomb. I've used uh, Batman with a bomb, and this is sort of like a, a you know Joker scenario. I can kind of imagine that Batman has been strapped down inside of an apparatus where a laser may or may not set off a bomb that will kill him. So classic Joker move. I originally wasn't going to attribute the role of the Joker to anyone in particular, but now I found out that Avi would rather have the bomb kind of adjacent to the path. Lev wants the bomb right in the path. So Lev, I think you're the Joker in this analogy. Um, okay, so there are two things that can happen with this. One, the, the uh, photon strikes the bomb and blows it up. Batman dies. Um, so when I switch to this purple color, that's our retrodicted classical path. So we say we know where the photon has to have gone through the entire experiment. So the green will be forward evolving wave function in time, purple will be for retrodicted paths. So if we see the bomb explode, then we think the photon had to have gone this way. That's pretty straightforward. But if the bomb doesn't explode, then we think that the photon had to have gone the other way. And because the dark port fired, we've detected the presence of, of the bomb in the path. So this is the standard protocol. So now we're going to modify it a little bit. Instead of having just a bomb that blows up, we're going to have a quantum system that's there. And part of that quantum system is in the path where it would block, fully block the, the path of the photon. And then part of it is outside the path where it wouldn't. And this system is in its energetic ground state when it's spread out like this. Part of it is in the path and part of it is out of the path. Uh, and this is our, this is our uh, paper here. Look, if you want more details. Um, we often talk about uh, this system with two, two states as a qubit, but this is Batman, so I'm going to call it a qubat. I apologize. Um, so this is our quantum bat. All right, so um, I'm going to walk through the evolution of this state. This might be a little bit, slower, you know, uh, needlessly pedantic, but it makes sure everything is clear. And the, the, this, the evolution of this state and some of the consequences of different ways you can analyze this experiment are interesting. So after I get through the core idea, I'll talk about some other things we can do with, with this, uh, this setup or how we can look at it. So this one's simple. We just send our photon in and it goes through the beep splitter. Um, the notation I'm using here is this one gamma here it means I've got one photon in the mode. So, so far we have photons in all the modes and this in plus out is the ground state of our qubat over here. All right, so now we evolve a little bit further in time. And now what's happened is that over here on path one, um, for the Batman that was in, the photon has been absorbed, so it's gone, no photon in the mode. Um, for the Batman that was out, the photon has not been absorbed, but it actually has exchanged a little bit of energy with um, the, the Q-bat here. So th that's why I use this tilde here. That denotes that this is a slightly changed energy. 
So in order for this experiment to work, we need to use a photon that has a very broad energy distribution, has to have a large uncertainty in energy, so that when we do this small change in the energy um, locally here, you know, where this thing goes by and Batman's outside, um, we'll still get interference when the part that makes it through gets to the second beam splitter. So there's a tiny, tiny shift, you know, in a otherwise very broad energy distribution for this photon. And then because it has a broad distribution of energy, it can go through at a well-defined well time. <laughs> okay, so the next step is to look at what happens when we get through the, the last beam splitter. And so this state right here is kind of the, the, uh, the key to everything that's interesting about, uh, about this experiment. So we've got these two modes, this one here and this one here, uh, where the, the photon has been absorbed. So those are the ones where Batman uh, absorbed the photon, blocked it from the path, and um, then there's a few other terms that will go to the bright port. So there's this one and this one. And then there's this last term here, which goes to the dark port. Photon is still in the mode. And the result, when, when we get that dark port to fire, is that now we know that Batman is in the in state. So it's just this one last term here. Um, and so that constitutes our interaction-free measurement again, because now we know Batman had to have been in the path. He would have blocked the photon from going through. So we can retrodict this path that the photon would have had to have taken uh, and wouldn't have gone near him. Nevertheless, the state of Batman has gained a certain amount of energy because he went from his ground state to the superposition state and uh, the photon has lost the energy. And showing how that works is a little bit uh, tricky, but we can analyze it a few different ways. So this is kind of the already the end of the, the main idea that by having this superposed quantum system, which is in its ground state when it's partially in, in the path and partially out of the path. If we uh, do an interaction free measurement, um, we find that we end up forcing it into the path. We conclude that the photon could not have gone through because it would have been blocked had it been in the path. Um, and somehow the photon not having not gone there, nevertheless delivered some energy to the, the, the quantum bed. So this is our non-local energy transfer. Yes, Liv. It's going to be sure. You say that uh, if you put a mirror instead of beam splitter, so there is nothing, and you send the photon, it's come with one energy. And if you put this interaction free story and the block and you get forbidden this forbidden claim, it will come with another energy. This is the claim. That's the claim, yeah. Yeah. So um, we, we, the way that we modeled this was a bit uh, idealistic. We treated the, the Batman as being um, a zero temperature bath with harmonic modes that absorb at every frequency. So it's like a perfect, a perfect absorber. Um, but you go through the analysis of this and you find that indeed the, uh, the energy of the photon has changed in this case and not in the other case. Not if you just sent a laser down a path, it wouldn't, you wouldn't expect it to change. But because there was this, you know, Entanglement between the two systems that happened here. Um, there is there is a, a possibility of energy change because it's partly it's partly this term with the, the sigma here that actually makes it through, and that one already exchanged energy or with the tilde here, sir. So just there's a quantum object that some part of the wave goes through. This is kind of good. Oh, I don't. Does it you? I mean, yeah, some part of the wave. Uh, well, some part of the wave. Passes by, so Batman. You know, half this turn here, Batman is out outside the arm. He passes, or the, the state passes by. Um, but because of the second beam splitter, we end up with interference. In fact, I can show it here. So, what happens is that I have the uh, the out term here and this out term here. Um, okay. So, so may I just interpretation: the Batman can be a party and nothing. I have heard. Yeah, yeah, it's like the Hardy paradox. Batman can measure your photon, and your photon was white, and your eye frame localizes it in a particular location. And when it's localized in a particular location, of course, it gets more energy. Yeah, yeah, you, the stuff. yeah. So why do you need the other left? Um, well, why, why do you need the other part? You can just use the eye frame of the right. Right, but I want it to be interaction free. I mean, that's. So if I if I just send the photon back past here, this is like a local interaction. This is the thing that, that Dicka worked out some a long time ago. My last comment is okay. I, 
uh, when the photon is on the right, it's for me it's not interaction free. And this is exactly the situation when you consider <laughs> that your Batman is quantum and it's allowed to do this. So it's for me the photon was there, so I cannot. Yeah, I mean, the thing is that it's not interaction free. Yeah, well, I mean, I largely agree with you. I think you only conclude this is interaction free if you insist I have to retrodict one classical path no, no, and no, the no, Batman no, is now in. Is okay. I can, it's interaction free if I can, uh, if my probe left no trace in an interaction region. Okay. Well, this is, this is it, an understanding of what an interaction free measurement is. You look at where the thing would have had to have gone. Maybe it's not exactly yours, but I think everyone understands what the idea is that the, the Batman here would have blocked the path. And so we assume it had to have gone the other way. So that's that's the argument. Avi? Here you are making the bomb quantum mechanical. So now there are three possibilities the bomb exploding, the bomb not exploding, and the bomb moving its interference factor. So, and in this case, I, I'm not sure that you need the energy story. It could be a simple particle which either blocks the, the photon or not, not, not receiving any energy. And then you just carry later an interference experiment on the on that particle, on that blocking particle, and you will see that that particle will also go to be uh, because it has lost its interference. It will collapse into the inner the inner path. Yeah. So if you are using energy, but uh, I'm I'm not sure it's necessary. You could do it even without the atom being uh, being excited or ground. I mean, I think you're right, but the point of this is that we can do it with the energy. We're able to see this transfer where it looks like the photon has not gone. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the key idea. Question, Maybe Jeff? Maybe I'm jumping again, but if you were to set this up exactly with the like the post section in the Hardy, the interesting Hardy phase, I'm curious what would happen. How did you? That's pretty much what we have here. I mean, so why isn't it? I'll, I'll talk. So the Hardy case, you post select both systems, and I'll talk about that at the end of the talk. But this this is this situation is very very similar to the Hardy situation. But if yeah. you look at what happens with the, for example, the weak value of occupation. Yes, I'll, I'll, we're going to get there. I'll talk about all that stuff. Yeah. So 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 if I localize Batman and and, and just the right side, so it's out, uh, outside the path, that that would be an interaction between the photon and Batman. And it would be local. Yeah, this was something that Dick showed a long time ago. That if you have just send a photon through a state which was superposed. If the photon gets through and is not doesn't interact with the thing, you've localized it to the other side, and that does exchange energy between the photon and the system. So that's what's happening for the term where the photon goes by and Batman is on the outside. That's why we get the one tilde. There's a little bit of local energy exchange. And you're not calling that interaction free. Well, no, I'm not. Again, that's just part of the evolution of the of the of the wave function. And like I said, I mean, we all we can all see that the wave function goes everywhere in this interferometer. There's some part of it that's making it all the way through. Yeah. Yes, that's exactly how much energy it is. In fact, it's it's half of that because we've gone from a ground state to a state that's a superposition of the first uh, of the ground state and the first excited state. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. So let's move on. Okay. So now we're going to talk about post selection. So I'm going to use this orange for uh, a backward evolving wave function that starts at the dark port and works its way backward through the interferometer. Um, so uh, similar to what Love was talking about, we're going to um, say that you know the particle leaves a trace in the place where uh, you have both the uh, forward and backward evolving states. So now we have a somewhat cluttered slide. So where you see the the orange and the green overlapping, that's where um, we would expect to find a trace for the particle. But there are a number of uh, interesting weak values if we consider this green post selection. So here is our pre-selected state evolved from the, the, the past up to here. Here's our post-selected state evolved from the dark board back to here and, and, and over here. Uh, so we're, we're looking at a particular time slice where the you know the photon would have been in some superposition of this path if it had been able to make it through. But because we have this post-selection within, the photon can't make it through backwards. Um, and so we don't have any overlap of the two paths over here in this part of it. There is overlap above and not overlap down? Yeah. Yeah, because remember we had, here's our post-selected state coming down from the second beam splitter. Oh, yeah. And then here's the part that makes it through, um, the part where Batman was on the outside. It can make through, then the, then the backward also can make through. Well, again, it's a different post-selection. This was the pre-selected state. But if I look at the post-selection, Batman is definitely in. And so he definitely blocks the path. 
So we've, we have a, we've ended up with a different post selection. Okay. Okay. I mean, if, if he's there, he's acting just like your, your original no, bomb, no. if he's in the past. Yes, it was a Hardy and localized by Cotton, but my backward was in Cotton. Well, I'm sorry, say that again? Your Batman is quantum. So it might be Nazi IFL, which localized the Cotton on this part. And this would allow, and this is also allow this for vision click. If, if I'm verifying non demolition way that the Cotton took the right path, I can get forbidden click. And if my Batman is quantum, I cannot be sure that this is what he is doing. And so, and I, it's kind of, the story should be symmetric. If the forward goes through, then the backward also goes through. I mean, it seems like the fact that my post selection has this state of the, of the Batman in the path blocking it should mean that it won't go through. I'm, I'm post selecting both systems. The photon. I'm post select. Yeah, the, the photon is the dark port. And the Batman is in. That's the state that I'm using as my post selection. I'm going to talk about different post selections later, but if that's the post selection, Batman is is in. So I mean, just imagine running this whole thing backwards, where I knew I put the bomb in there. This but is just like your interaction. If you post select that it's in. So in your world, it's in. So then the forward cannot go through it. Uh, well, I mean, we just saw that that's what we expect. The forward didn't go through because it was in. It, it would have gone this way. This was our our retrodiction. We would have expected it to have gone the other way, but if we look at the the overlap of the two wave functions, with given the post selection of the of both the photon and the Batman, this seems this seems to be how it looks. I I don't know what else I can tell you. I mean, if the if the bomb is there, it, it absorbs the photon in either direction. That's the premise of what the bomb is doing. In both directions, isn't it absorbed in both directions? No, in none directions. What I'm saying is that so it's for, for this state. The forward, uh, forward goes through and the backward doesn't. Well, look, for this state, the in term is the one where the thing is absorbed. I mean, that's that's what this is, is going on right here. That's if, for the part that Batman is in, the photon is absorbed. And so when I say that I go backwards, he's only in, then the photon is only absorbed. There's, okay. there's, not, a, there's not a superposition that, that makes it through. I think I should let you. Okay. Um, okay, so, so we can look at uh, the weak values of a bunch of different... Uh, you know, uh, operators for this particular case. So we're looking at this time slice here. So there are a few important things to note. Um, the first is that we find that the particle um, should definitely be on path two. And so we have all of the rank one projectors where we have joint states of the particle and the bomb. And if I wanna find the state of just the, the path, I have to sum over some of those projectors. And so I will conclude from doing that, that the particle is definitely on path two. It does not go where the Batman is and not on path zero. Um, and we'll also conclude, similar to the original uh, weak value paper, that Batman is in these two um, incompatible states simultaneously. It's spin Z and spin X are both defined, for example. So we have a uh, weak value of one for this state in, and also weak value of one for this state zero, the ground state. <clears throat> and we also over here find that you know the, the projector onto the ground state of, of Batman and the particle being on the other path is one. So that's what's happening before the, before the interaction, but given the, the post-selection taken into account. Okay, so now we'll evolve a little bit further forward, try to make sense of how this looks uh, in the uh, weak value picture. Yes. And just to come back to Lem's point, this is true because you post-selected on Batman being in. Yeah. Is there a reason why you did that as opposed to just post-selecting on the dark Um. I, well, yeah, I mean, I, I guess I could have done it that way as well. We could analyze if I only post select one of the systems. I did it because that's the case of interest. And so in analogy to the Hardy paradox, if you want to see all the interesting weak values come out, you post select the case where both dark ports fire. Okay. And so, so that's essentially what we're doing here. Is so kind of an implicit measurement of that man after you get the dark clicks to make sure that he was in. Yeah, that's right. And I'm going to talk about cases where we actually vary the basis that we measure him in. But yeah, okay. yeah. And I'm really sure that if you post select on a case with the button in, the photon cannot change its energy. Well, I mean, it change its energy if you post select that the bed one in in minus out. <laughs> then, then the energy of the photon will be changed. But when you post select the bed one in, no way that the photon, that your photon will, will change energy. Yeah, I mean, the analysis seems to work. <laughs> so, yeah. All right. Anyway, so I'll, I'll cruise along here. So this is uh, from our paper. This is actually um, modeling the, the interaction between the photon and the Batman over um, a short amount of time tau for the, for the uh, interaction. So this is while the photon is coupling to the, to the Batman. 
Um, this uh, gamma over here is related to the coupling strength and the, the frequencies of the systems involved. Um, so what happens during this interaction period is that the uh, projector for the particle on path one um, for the ground state energy goes down, becomes a, a negative projector. And for the first excited state energy of the Batman, but still with the photon on path one, that one goes up. And so these become half and negative half by the end of this period. And if we look at the Hamiltonians of the system, because we have a coupling Hamiltonian between them, what we see is that during this time period, the uh, Hamiltonian of the um, the Hamiltonian of the photon on path one uh, loses energy. The Hamiltonian of the um, overall photon, which is just the sum of these two, overall loses energy. And the Hamiltonian of the, the Batman gains some energy during this process. But, but what's your plan tell in this case? This this tau over here. Yeah. Okay. It's just that whatever we just chose a time scale for the interaction. So we say that, you know the photon takes this long to traverse where the Batman is, and there's a process of absorption and readmission that's happening during that uh, interaction. So that, that's how it, the way this was modeled is a little bit idealistic. So if there's any like weak point in this argument, it's right here. This is where there's something you could be skeptical of. <laughs> yeah. So those Hamiltonians. Uh, just going back to the analogy of the Hardy. So those. Those Hamiltonians assume that Batman is both in and the photon is and any growth, right? So how come that's not the similar to what happens in Hardy where you have the particles of their individually but not together? Um I, I think it ends up being pretty similar to what happens in Hardy. I'm not entirely sure I, I follow the question. The joint projectors are different. The joint projectors not the product of the individual projectors. Um isn't that what the you yeah, I mean, that, well, that, that's only generally true when you have um, states that aren't entangled anyway, and this state ends up being entangled. The post setup is an entangled state. Or sorry, the, 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 yeah. the hardest setup being entangled, but it didn't annihilate, for example. But you get you're saying for for the two qubits, you get weak values, which are just you, you take the weak value of one and take the weak value of the other, and then the weak value of the joint is the product. Yeah. I don't think no, that's no. the case. Oh, that's not what you're saying. Okay. No, I mean, I think Lev first pointed out that in general. For pre post selection, the product rule is not satisfied. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I wasn't expecting to. So maybe I mentioned it. Not, no, not getting a question. I by writing those Hamiltonians that, I mean, it sounds crazy when I talk about it, but this is the reality of what happened in the Hardy paradox that the particles were in the overlapping path together, but never there together. Yeah, I mean, these are just these are just the joint observables. So it's you know the, the observable I can write as tensor product. Um, it's just a matter of uh, what states I have to evaluate to get these weak values. So the pre and post selection, depending on what time slice we're in, will be entangled. Um, yeah, I think mean, mean, all all just point is is that if I look at, for example, the red curve, the joint weak value of the Hamiltonian gamma and the projector I. Is not equal to the product of the expectation of the Hamiltonian separately times the expectation of the of the projector. Right. That's yeah, but I mean, I, yeah, I don't think we should expect it to be. That was that, right. that, that, I, because the product rule is not satisfied for these situations. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. I'll, I'll continue unless there are more questions about this. Let's talk about that. Uh, yeah, I'm just curious. So this time is always less than the interactions. Time scale. Um, yeah, the the interaction time scale is supposed to be much much shorter than this, so that there are many many chances for the thing to be absorbed and readmitted during this this tau. Um, otherwise, you don't really get end up getting complete blocking. That's basically what it is. You have to let this go long enough that the photon is is going to be absorbed if the particle is in. Okay. So now we're going to look at the same scenario, but we've evolved to this point in time. So the particle will have already passed through. And now things start to get more interesting. This is really where we're going to see things that are more like the Hardy paradox. Uh, so if we look at the weak values on, on path one now, we have a negative weak value corresponding to the ground state and a positive weak value corresponding to the first excited state for the particle on path one. And on path two, we still have um, the particle uh, in the second, you know, for sure over here, but um, we now find that the weak value for the, the, this product of it being uh, in and on path two is one. So the, that, that was our, our post-selected case that we were interested in. Um, so the weak values uh, for the projectors are still zero for path one. It's a sum of a positive and a negative weak value. So we still conclude the weak value is zero, even up here where, the, where there was overlap between the two things. Um, it's, it's as though there's no, no particle there. However, the energy um, of, the, of these two terms, the energy exchange between the, the 
Batman and the, the photon is different for these two terms. And so there is a net energy that's negative being carried away here. Uh, and so if we think of this, you know, one way we can try to imagine what's happening here is that uh, Batman spontaneously gains energy by emitting a negative energy particle. And so energy is conserved locally during this little process. It's a weird process, but it conserves energy and it's local. Left. Can you just return to my point? If I understand correctly, your Batman is pretty narrow. It's narrow than the base function of the photon, correct? Uh, well, I mean, it starts at a superposition that's broader. But you mean like the in states? So, first, of all, it's I, the in state, the in state. Okay. Is it narrow than the wave function of the photon? It should be basically the same width <clears throat> because we want that if the in state is there, it will, it will block the photon. It doesn't need to be wider, but if it was narrower, then some photons would be able to go past. So so some amount of the in, It blocks completely. Yes. That's the idea. It's like the bottom. It blocks the path completely. Okay. All right. So, uh, yeah, so th that's pretty much what there is to say about this. And now we can actually look at this in a, in a different picture. So this is Yakir's picture with the particles and negative uh, counter particles that, that appear. So this one, this slide will take a little bit longer to explain. So I'll just walk through it slowly. This one sort of shows all the time steps at once. Um, so here are at the pre-selection, we end up with an extra pair of positive negative copies of the photon. So the, the, one of the pluses is just the original photon, but we end up with uh, two new copies of it. This negative one has negative energy. It's, it's opposite for all physical properties of the original photon. Now, because the states are entangled, really the, each of these is actually coupled to a state of the Batman, but it would have been a big mess to try and draw them at every time step. So I'm only drawing the Batman here. And you see this is a little red line here. It shows that this is a, a this is a, a joint state. So the part of uh, Yakir's picture for entangled states is that you end up with these um, non or delocalized coupled objects between the two systems. Um, so really, each of these rank one projectors, you see, it's a, it's a product state of both systems. And so those are the fundamental entities in this picture. They're the joint states of both systems. That's why we have these little linkages here. So what's happening here? I create the, the extra copies, and this one is corresponding to Batman in the ground state. This one is Batman in the ground state. This one is Batman in the negative ground state energy. So that's the, there have been extra copies of Batman created here at the beginning as well. I've just omitted them from the drawing, but they all appear over here. Okay, so then we come to our first beam splitter. The, uh, the particles divide up in this way. Over here, the projector is summed to zero. And this happens with probability one half to get the, the values that we actually saw in the experiment. Um, there's a little bit of a subtlety here. Another feature of the interpretation is that uh, even though this part only happens half the time, if I couple a weak value pointer to the system, it sees the same thing every time as though this was going on uh, with a half weight. So there's a non-local property. Even when we have the half of the cases where there's only this particle going this way, um, if I couple a pointer over here, I'll still see all of this stuff. It's just a non-local coupling between the system and the pointer. So that's a that's a detail that's not really important to any of the analysis, but it just helps kind of complete what the story for this picture actually is. Okay, so now we come to the, the interaction point. So uh, the particle interacts with the bomb or with the Batman, and we have our negative Batman here and uh, the negative energy of the photon. So that was the copy that was created. This one isn't actually affected by the interaction. It's just the same as it was over here. Uh, and this one over here, the Batman's not really located over here. It's just, we have this linked state. So the Batman's still over here. He's still in his ground state. Um, and he's coupled to the particle that's on this path, no energy exchange. But then there's this turn here where we have uh, the, the Batman um, ending up in the first excited state, E1. And the, so he's gained energy, the difference between where he started, E0 and E1. And that energy has been lost by this photon. And that's our, that's the local, uh, coupling that we expect. And now if I uh, get to the end of this experiment and I add everything up and I take that half probability into account, I end up seeing that indeed the, uh, the photon has lost the energy, this delta E, and the Batman gained the energy delta E, started at E naught, and so now he ends up at an equal, an average of E1 and E naught. Um, and we can also uh, see that this Batman over here and, and the qubit pair, and this one over here, they have the same energy except opposite sign. So I can just let these two 
get reabsorbed into the vacuum and disappear. And I'm left with this one, which has lost the energy. And so that's the way we can explain this in the, the you know, this uh, counterparticle or twin, anti-twin or negaparticle ontology. We have come up with a bunch of different names for this now. So, but this is what you know, was talking about a little bit yesterday. Um, if you think like, so, if, you know, for example, the three box paradox can be interpreted as a positive particle in two of the boxes and a negative particle in the third box. That will explain the weak values. Any questions about this? It's a lot on the slide. It's novel. Yes. Yes. And now you have a question. So, I thought part of the point of this neg negative particle business was to preserve locality. But here you're talking about the delocalized pair of objects. What's the deal then? Um, it, it ends up not really being about preserving locality. Like you're, you're thinking of conversations that we had a long time ago. Uh, there's sort of like another variation of this model that we worked on, which did preserve locality better, um, but it doesn't handle this issue of um, weak values that aren't integers very well. It ends up creating, if you follow that model where, where it appears to lead, it ends up creating a spread in the pointer, which it wouldn't actually be there. Um, so how should I interpret these pairs? Is it that there is like in the upper pad, is that a, a particle of the photon that's aware not locally of what's going on with the Batman or is that actually like some- I don't know if aware non-locally is the right way to describe it, it but, but, but it is nevertheless the case that if I couple a pointer to this system, even if I'm looking at the, so because this is half the time, suppose I'm looking at a case where this doesn't happen, there's only a particle up here. But if I couple a pointer over here on this path, it is going to couple to this thing non-locally and see these weak values, the weak values that would have been produced by these, these objects over here. So the, the weak values are properties that the particle is carrying all the time, or the system is carrying all the time. Um, and they have the same value. The way they couple to the pointer will be the same. Yeah, so, so does that mean like the tab on the left? Should I think of that Batman being a property of the particle on the particle traveling along the left path? Like a Batman property that is on that photon or something like that. Um, I don't know if I would say that it's a. Because if you seem yeah. to have a locality going on here where you're separating the physical locations of these pairs, they're not actually delocalized. Yeah. But now they contain information on both sides. I'm trying to understand what you mean by that. Yeah, I don't know if I have a really good answer for you. Yakir, do you? Uh, I don't know if you've been following closely. Do you have an answer for this question or did you not follow the question? What's the question? <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to understand it. Does, does this mean like if you care in that, that left particle there that never interacts with that man? What, when Kai is saying it's a, a joint fat man photon particle, does it mean that it's localized on the left path? It's not it one particle. Of that man, or does it mean something else? And also, what what is the picture here? What are the positive and negative projectors I'm going to? They're right here. You can see them on the side. So path one, path two, and the ground state, first excited state uh, for the for the system. So the, that, that's really like to see where this comes from. These four things are the fundamental objects, and they are pairwise properties of these two systems, which may become space-like separated. You know, some some of the time they are. So it's not that there's only one particle that is both the Batman and the and the photon. There are two, but they're sort of non-locally linked because these are the joint. These are the fundamental entities that in this model. Yeah, but I'm trying to distinguish between non-locally linked correlation-wise and saying that there is a thing that travels along this local path because it seems like you're very clearly making a distinction between three things, each of which only go along one path. Yeah, I mean, the really all, all I'm doing with this picture is just unpacking what the weak values say in the picture that, that right, has been I developed. I understand what the unpacking is. Yeah, well. I understand the weak values. I mean, I the, the unpacking, at least it gives you that you could think of this energy transfer as being a local thing. But you've you've you know made the sacrifice of now having these non-locally linked objects. So you have definite particle trajectories. All of the energy exchanges are local, um, but the objects that you know are, are being interacted with locally actually are connected over over multiple locations. So I have an object. It's moving. It's got two two different components. But if I exchange energy with this part, it's because there was something locally that exchanged energy with that part. 
But if we talk about the energy exchange with the pointer, it gets a little bit more subtle. All right, so there's one more thing to point out about this scenario here. And this is something that um, Yakir likes to talk about as the, the Cheshire cat effect, where we have a property of a system where the projector is zero. So the projector weak value uh, over here, if I look, on path one is zero. So I, I would potentially conclude that there's no particle there. If I measured its mass or charge, I would not find the particle there. But nevertheless, the energy uh, of the particle over here is not zero. Uh, it's, it's, we have the difference of these two, or the sum of these two, rather. So the, the, the E of the original photon cancels out, and I'm left with this negative delta E here. So I, I have energy propagating through a place where the projector of the particle is zero. So the, project, the energy weak value is not zero, but the projector to be in that location is zero. So it, it looks like we've separated the energy from the photon in some sense. So this sort of like a phantom object that goes through here and arrives here. And the, but the way we can interpret that phantom object is it's not that there's nothing there, it's that there's a sum of a positive and a negative thing there, which uh, when they couple to a pointer together, they cancel out the effect. It's as though there's nothing there. But in Cheshire case of this kind of thing, there's an experiment which you can find trace. Can you find the trace here? Uh, I don't know the answer. I, I've, I've been thinking about how you might try to do this experiment with, with this kind of Cheshire cat effect, and I, I don't have a clear picture for how to do it yet. So. All right. You can have the situation where the same a positive energy, positive particle carries one energy, negative particle carries slightly different energy, and they go together and they don't leave any trace because the energy. That doesn't leave any space, so there is no trace, but you can then separately, you can see when they move together in each middle, then you see that there was something there. If you make a local measurement of energy exchange or something like this, then it should, uh, this operator should move one energy to another one and it should be non zero. So there is no way to make a local measurement of energy. There is no way. All right, so this was just one slide dedicated to this, this uh, ontology, and now I'll, I'll talk about some other aspects of this that are interesting. So I talked about this a little bit earlier on. So if I post-select both systems, so if I, let's say that at the end of this, I measure the qubat in the in-out basis. Um, there's a possibility that I'll find out, but it's only going to be when I find the bright port. So if I, if I wanted to post-select on the dark port and out, that would be zero, but probability that would be zero. But if I um, if I post-select on Batman being out, then I end up projecting the, the state down like this, and we, we would regain our constructive interference, again, assuming that this and this have close enough energy that they still interfere pretty much perfectly. Um, so there's really no, we approximate these two as being the same, and then we end up at the bright port with certainty. And in this case, the there is energy exchange, but it, we can we can think of it as local. This is just the the case that Dicka worked out a long time ago, where the photon goes through where the particle is, does not hit it, localizes it over to the other side, and so there's some local energy exchange. Okay, but if I do that same post selection and get in, which is also has some probability, it'll end up being the dark port where I have um, a possibility if I see it in. But now I, I retrodict this particular path, and this, this is back to our, our the, the original case we were talking about for the non-local energy transfer. So I've post-selected the, the qubat in this particular basis in out, and those are the two different outcomes I can find, and they correspond to the two different ports. But something interesting happens. So suppose that we look at this in this temporal order. I've let the photon go through. It's already been detected. Um, let's say it's been detected at the dark port. We'll, we'll focus on that case. And now I do a measurement of, of Batman in the in-out basis. Okay, I'll definitely find him in for this case. But I could have post-selected Batman in a different basis. And what would happen if I did that? Well, if I post-select Batman in the energy eigen basis, let's look back at what the state was here. This is the uh, this is the zero state. And so this whole term is orthogonal to this uh, post-selection. And so if I post-select and I find uh, Batman in the first excited state, then uh, it had to have come from this term right here. And so if we let the thing evolve forward in time, this is how it gets to the dark port. And now we would retrodict that the photon had to have taken the other path. So the photon's already been detected at the dark port. It's a done deal. But now I choose my basis later on for how I'm going to measure Batman. 
And for one of the choices, I end up concluding that the photon could only have taken path two. And for the other choice, I end up concluding the photon could only have taken path one. So, you know, this, this is just sort of showing that the, the claim there had to have been one classical path is pretty dubious because by choosing what I do after the photon's already done its travel through the interferometer and arrived, uh, by choosing how I measure the Batman, I'll end up with two different stories for which way the photon went through there. If I insist it had to have followed one particular path. So I think that the lesson here is that we just should not be trying to insist that it follows one particular path, which I think Lev agrees with now. Uh, this is my last slide. Was exactly this. If you first select on your photo and you don't look and you start with the superposition of your beta, then uh, you cannot say it's interaction free. You don't know where it is. But if you test, if you test your beta where it was here and here, I believe strongly that first you'll find it with very high probability to observe, and then and. I already lost, uh, I think, a couple of bottles to you here. I will ready to put another bet for you that if you measure your batman in the way that it's closed completely, the photon, your photon will not get any energy. So if uh, we can discuss it. We need to talk to one of the clever experimentalists in the room about uh, how, how they're going to do uh, this experiment. So. My uh, refrigerator with wine will probably not be empty. <laughs> we'll clean you I, I put the bet that if, if, as you said, that uh, your post selection is testing if it's uh, on the left side and in blocks photon completely, then I don't see any way how it can get energy to the dark part, the dark part of the photon. Okay, yeah, I mean, like I said, it. I don't see any problem with the analysis we've done. We've we've gone through the treatment. It seems to work this way. So, no. so maybe I maybe I have a bottle of wine in my future. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay, and that's it. So um, this is just a review of what we talked about. So if we insist on retrodicting a single trajectory for the photon, then we end up concluding that the energy had to be transferred non-locally. But I think that that assumption that we should retrodict the path is kind of the problem. I don't really think that energy has been transferred non-locally here. And indeed, we saw how the negative energy component can be moved along um, in the section of the inferometer past the Batman. So if we look at the weak values, we can um, we can kind of take the naive uh, you know, view where we just see that there seems to be negative energy in that section. So we can think that there's some kind of negative energy particle that's been sent out. And if we go to uh, this uh, particle ontology, um, we can get a more concrete picture where we have the extra positive negative particles coming out and we see exactly which ones are exchanging energy. So the kind of first order picture of the weak values is that Batman gains energy by emitting a negative energy photon. The other picture is that there was already a positive negative pair coming up to arrive where Batman was and they couple to the, the bomb locally and then they recombine later on. Um, so I didn't have to spontaneously create a negative energy photon at the location of the Batman. He just coupled to something, you know, to a pair of particles that were coming along, and that's how the energy was transferred. Um, <clears throat> and finally, as I was just talking about, if we do insist that we have a, a single path, then we end up with this weird situation where a choice I make later about a measurement setting can change which path I insist it already was in the past. And that seems pretty strange. Okay, that's all for this. So, so thank you very much. <laughs>
Yeah, I think it'll depend on the scenario. If we did something like the original DICA setup, I think for sure we would be able to say where it happened because we could we could sort of drop in a, a, an energy sensitive detector anywhere we wanted as soon as the thing had, had passed through the, the atom. But because we have the, the other arm the thing can travel on, I think it's, a, I, I don't know the answer off the bat. I think it's a little bit more subtle what's going on because of the interaction free aspects of the setup. That's why I'm asking a question because we have this decomposition and it's just like mega particles and then whatnot. Does that give insight to this? This question, like, does that allow you to reason about whether you could detect where the bomb was? Um, yeah, I mean, I think in principle you could you could come along and measure these weak values, right? You could see these half and minus half, and they yeah, they, they, they go from being zero before, no, sorry, uh, being being zero before this part to being one half and negative one half here. So, I, I mean, if that's what you're asking, is like, is there a place where I would see something change? Yes, I would see these weak values change. Only after I did post-selection and conditioning to get out these weak values would I actually be able to detect it. But I would be able to infer that that's when it happened after the fact. Yeah, but to, to measure this phase difference, you wouldn't want to do a total post-selection. You want to look at the ratio of the probabilities of dark and bright. That would allow you to get the phase information. Yeah. So it's a slightly different question you're asking. But, but yeah. you know, this mechanism you're talking about, does that allow you to extract that? So I don't know. I think that when we did the analysis, we basically just assumed that the uh, the spread of the of the photon was going to be large enough that these would these would be approximately the same. Um, so we we didn't take into account how the interference pattern would change because of the difference. We just assumed that when we got to the interference stage, they were the same. So that's the approximation we took. Yeah. Again, if there's any place where there's something fishy to you know to to, to point at in here, it's kind of what was happening during this interaction. Um, That's and question. yeah, have written down with the Hamiltonian. Yeah, yeah, this is all this is all in the paper. You can see the Hamiltonian and it's in the paper. Yes, it's not, here. Okay. it's not here yet. It's a it's, it's in an appendix of the paper. It's it's kind of a, a, a tedious calculation. Actually, we can, we can talk about this later. Yeah, look, show uh, the same slide where the bright form. Okay, again, uh, can you repeat? Because again, you say that uh, in uh, the Batman in is complete blocking the photon. The Batman out completely not blocking the photon. Is it correct? Yeah. And you still say that there are some changing changes in the photon. Yeah. And again, that's that's the, just the Dicker result. That's not anything. That, that's the Dicker result from the 80s or early 90s. The result that he's surprised. That but this is what... Change this... in Batman, there is no change in the photon. And you could change in the photon. Dicky. Clearly says because there is no change in the photon. I don't think that's right. I, this is what I mean. Yeah, the, as far as I know, at the end of the, the, the sort of the conclusion of that paper, he he concludes that there is energy exchange. The photon lost the energy. The the qubit uh, gained it. That's qubit. I mean, we can, we can go look at the paper, but um, yeah. The photon never nothing happened to the photon. This, this was this is the whole idea. Nothing happened to the photon. Like yeah, don't I, click the okay. Click. Uh, well, coming from th this is not how I remember the paper. I have to look at it. It's been a little while. Um, but yeah, I, I'm pretty sure that the conclusion was that there wasn't any change. Kind of bright, but not, are you sure that uh, you, you said that they're slightly different, but not different enough to change? To blue? If if you find it out, will you sometimes break the interference? I still don't. You had this. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, again, there is this tiny difference between yeah, these two things. Is, and so you will you get. Spell out what do you mean by this? Say that again, sir. Can you spell out what do you mean by this tiny difference? Well, again, we have an energy distribution for the photon, and the, the one with the tilde has been shifted just a tiny bit. It's very, very broad. And so there's still, you know, the, the overlap between those two energy distributions is nearly one. The photon was here, and the Batman was found there. It's still something happened to the right photon. So this is small. Oh, oh, yeah. Um, no, so the interaction, the local interaction is between these two. It's, so it's the, the one that passes through. Again, the way we model this is there's sort of a continuous sequence of absorption and re-emission. So there's definitely interaction between the two systems. It's just that when the photon makes it out, the, the Batman's been projected into the state that's out um, by the end of that process. Yeah. I think we're about out of time. Um, I'm going to ask you to Maybe one point to make is that the predictions of the energy exchange are indeed for the photon having a very, very broad uh, time profile. 
and also our independent well, energy profile, right? Uh, in, in, uh, it's kind of narrow energy, energy profile, yeah. and also the fact that the, that the prediction of the exchange are independent of the interpretation. So the negative and particle stuff is one story you can tell, yeah. but but the results are independent. Yeah, that's why I, I tried to finish the main story of what the paper is before I got into all these extra things about the the, the weak values and counter particles and stuff. Well, one yeah. more comment. Yeah. Surely there is a variation of these experiments where a method in the form of the law on this path of the pair will split them for for, for a great while. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, Kira and I have been talking about that. So I, I think and it's worth carrying out because then again, a weak measurement will show that one of the mirrors gets a negative push. It is something that you can show experimentally and add, yeah. add some rigor. Yeah, I mean, it, it would flesh out the story. Um, let's see, this made me think of one uh, other detail. Yeah, so, you know, this is a bit of a I don't want to take too much time, but you know, Lev and I were talking a while ago about this issue of robustly zero weak values, and zero weak values, and here, you know, there's a, there are weak values that are non-zero that I could measure over here, but over here, there's nothing I could measure that's non-zero, and so we sort of we're sort of inferring that these particles had to have been created here and gone all the way through, um, but Yakir has an argument for why we should insist these are here, and it has to do with measuring uh, the joints um, observables. So if I if I measure like the observables uh, for the projector one plus two and one minus two, I'll find that those are non-zero. And so and uh, so that seems to imply that there is something on both of these paths. Um, so this is kind of a secondary argument for why we should think these are actually here. There is something non-zero that's related to particles being on this path. Okay. Let's thank Kai again.